what we're doing and why we're doing it. Right. And like I said, we're at the point tonight where when you talk about <clears throat> how you want to invest in your, in your natural resources to help meet your open space and recreation goals, like I said, it's all about your plans, right. your municipal vulnerability preparedness plan and your climate response and resiliency goals. We've kind of given you an assessment of what you have and it complements, say, what Peter Newton even did, you know, a couple of years back when he talked about your water resources so that, you know, everything on the east side is probably good for your water resources and you're right at the tip of the Plymouth Carver for there. But everything on your west side over here, you're in that wonderful swath of natural land that the Commonwealth says is, you know, top 5% of, uh, you know, critical habitat areas, you know, critical conservation areas in the Commonwealth. Right. So... What we have to do is we really have to take a deep dive and see what we have there and what we should protect. And like I said, Eric, Eric and Neil kind of laid the groundwork there with the uh, uh, green infrastructure maps and showed you what you have, what's critical and what's unprotected. I mean, proportionally, Plimpton has a lot of carbon critical soil, a lot of natural you know, green infrastructure, critical green infrastructure. Alex told you about the wonders, like I said, of cranberry bogs and wetlands restoration. And it gets to the point now, us being good investors and trying to put together a great portfolio for you, sometimes we have to go back in and, and use our tools. Right. This is where we bring the smart people in. You know, the rest of us, we just go out there and walk on the land. This is where we bring our smart people in who develop tools to help us really look at these things and help us prioritize things. So tonight we have an, another member of our network, the Resilient Taunton Watershed Network, Sarah Burns, who's a water scientist with the Nature Conservancy. I love working with Sarah. Like I said, I wish I worked with her every day in the same building with Helen and Eric and everybody else. And Sarah's going to tell us about a tool that the Nature Conservancy has developed to help us assess uh, the nature-based solutions and potential land areas. Yeah. So it's a little deeper dive, a little, you know, a little bit more about some of the land we've probably covered, but it's a really interesting concept. And I think it yes. will really help the town prioritize what they're going after. Yeah. So I'm going to just turn it over to Sarah at this point and uh, she can take it away. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. I think um, I need to be permitted to share my screen. Um, so I have some slides that I'm going to walk through. And then uh, if you want, we can either just do Q&A talking or we can actually go deep into the tool and look even at the parcel level if there's areas that you all want to follow up on. Okay. So, okay, here we go. Share my screen. So, all right. So I'm with the Nature Conservancy. Obviously, you know the name of your project. So we're going to look at this uh, tool for mapping nature-based solutions. Um, I know the focus of the action grant is the Winnetuxet watershed, but um, I did a little screen of your townwide opportunities. And like oh, I great. said, we can dig in a little bit later if we want to. Um, and Bill has been keeping me in the loop um, of what you've been talking about with some of your previous guests. So I'm, I'm gonna try to bring some of that in. Um, but as you said, Linda, there, I'm sure there will be follow-up questions. <laughs> so uh, the Nature Conservancy started developing this tool, which is available right now on our website at this link. Uh, we call it Citing Nature-Based Solutions for Climate Resilience in Massachusetts. It, um, it matches up we tried to match it up really closely with the state's municipal vulnerability preparedness program. Um, and someday the tool might live on the data viewer that EEA has been pulling together to support, um, to support MVP priorities. Um, and I can mention this later, there is an actual report that you can link through online too that has some framing for why different conservation and restoration projects either retain resilience that you already have or could bring resilience back to the land. So there's, uh, it could be helpful for framing up um, funding requests. So you've probably seen this definition before, but I'm gonna say it again anyway. So uh, the, we're gonna talk a lot about nature-based solutions. And this is a pretty close to the definition that EEA is using for their MVP program. So nature-based solutions are projects that protect, restore, and or manage an existing ecological system or mimics natural processes to protect public health and clean water, to increase natural hazard resilience, and to sequester carbon. Um, and so that is very much the same as how we've structured these maps. 
So we um, didn't do any like super fancy modeling for this project. We took a lot of existing statewide data and layered it up to think about hazards in three categories. So we have um, potential future footprint of inland flood uh, hazard, coastal flooding, and then uh, the drought isn't quite as forward looking, um, but the inland flood and the coastal flood are more forward looking. And then we take those hazard footprints and then we look across opportunities to do conservation, restoration of destro destroyed or degraded habitats and management of things like stormwater to see how those nature-based solutions opportunities overlap with potential future hazard footprints to really think about how nature-based solutions can help uh, give you the most bang for the buck basically um, and thinking about hazard reduction. So uh, before I dive all in, I just wanted to sort of bring back the project goals um, that, it, you know, I think that the maps can really help us look through. So, you know, securing a drinking water supply isn't a perfect fit. I probably won't be able to tell you where to look to put new wellheads, but we can think about opportunities for retaining and restoring drought resilience. We can certainly think about opportunities again for conservation and restoration to help you with inland flood control. And we also have a biodiversity overlay. So where you can think about how to frame up co-benefits to any projects that you might do. And I'll say this again a little bit later, but um, some of the outputs, especially for Plimpton, might be really helpful as you think about protection of rural character with a bylaw review. Um, you might be able to think about areas where you really want to encourage, you know, flood protection or think about driving development in another direction. Uh, so, as I said, I've been trying to keep up with um, all your previous speakers. I know you've heard about priority forest management, um, preserving soil carbon and cranberry bog restoration and that bylaw review is coming. Um, and especially with the, you know, this is a slide that I think Jim Newman presented about the soil carbon opportunities in different restored um, ecosystems types. And it's exciting to see, I actually learned a little bit uh, <laughs> looking at your old presentations as well, but this restored peatland and restored wetland that out, that's outsized carbon. That's really exciting, obviously, especially in uh, conjunction with the Greenberry bog restoration opportunities. So I'll try to uh, tie that back in after we go through uh, the review of town. So you probably saw this on my screen uh, when I first started sharing. I'll, I'll, I'll share the slides for sure. This link is live, so you can click right through. You hit go to see regional planning, and then uh, there's a couple of things that live in here. So what you'd pick is citing nature-based solutions for climate resilience in Massachusetts. We went with a short, you know, <laughs> easy to say name. Um, and we also have the parcels mapped out, which I mentioned before, which can really help us dig in on potential opportunities. You don't have to really uh, try to retain anything from this slide. It's just kind of a cheat sheet for all of the information that these maps have. Um, if you want to come back to it and think like, what can I explore? Um, this is a cheat sheet. All right, so now I have a couple of slides, like I said, that I sort of pre-vetted just to look at together with you. Um, and so I'll walk through those and kind of explain how this comes together and we can look at parts of town and then we can be a little more interactive in a few minutes. So um, I know the, the biodiversity is an important uh, priority for Plimpton. And the way that this tool uh, treats biodiversity is we have two tiers of opportunity. So you can have an area of high quality habitat where you have biomap to either core or critical natural landscapes, TNC resilient sites for conservation. And I'll just, you may, may or may not remember this, those two things are part of Manomet's green infrastructure network also. So you may have seen some of this already. And then we also have high integrity wetlands that have been assessed by the UMass uh, CAPS, Index of Ecological Integrity is what IEI stands for. So that's tier one. And then tier two is areas that, um, according to a TNC analysis, allow for um, movement of creatures across the landscape. So there's um, good regional flow. So you might not have um, all of these high quality uh, factors in a regional connectivity location, but you'd be connecting them. So that would be another co-benefit of a project. So <laughs> this may not be a surprise to you, but you have a lot of high quality habitat in Plimpton. All of that yellow is high quality habitat. 
So almost any project you picked, you'd be able to say that you were preserving or enhancing high quality habitat, which is fantastic. And comes back to Linda's point of, I guess you have more opportunity to refine this even more, right? Like you can pick oh, even specific priorities within this high quality habitat. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, there's a couple of, of spare places. So I thought I'd just look, you also have pretty good connectivity that overlaps with your high quality habitat as well. Um, and I didn't say this earlier, this regional connectivity is a model that was developed thinking about like the whole Appalachian mountain range, like thinking really about how species are going to move through time and be more resilient to climate change. So that's kind of, it's a larger scale connectivity also. And so you have overlap. So you have high quality habitat and areas that have really good connectivity. So there's a lot of biodiversity co-benefit in most of town. And I think Bill was talking about the Western part of town being a priority and, and you definitely have both there. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to say. I've got the Winnetex that um, sort of popped out here and a couple of roads in town. But other than that, there's really, that's all I'm showing so far. Um, oh, I have this in here twice. Okay, so next we can look at drought hazard. So the way that we have chosen to represent this, and we've, we've talked quite a bit with folks at EPA and the people who are working with the state on drought in Massachusetts, and we have two categories of drought also. So we have um, drought hazard present and drought hazard grade. <laughs> we should probably say greater. But the criteria are based on three things. So first we have um, the catchment has greater than 10% impervious cover. What that really represents is you're cutting off supply back to your groundwater. You're cutting off opportunities for recharge. Then the swimmy groundwater withdrawal category are areas that show ecologically that their groundwater is depleted by looking at um, ecological criteria. And then we have the DEP wellhead protection zones. So if you have a uh, drought hazard present, you have either any of these, one of these factors. And if you have a drought hazard that's greater, you would have greater than 10% impervious cover and either these ecological indicators of depleted groundwater or a DEP wellhead protection zone. So looking at Plimpton, uh, you have some areas down along the Winnet, uh, I'm gonna say that wrong, Winnetuxet, no I'm not, Winnetuxet that um, have drought hazard present. And then again, up here along in the North and the West. Um, I did some digging into this. I know that um, drought is a bigger problem maybe than for Plimpton than what it looks like on these maps. And I think uh, part of the, the story here is that our maps don't take into account private wells. And I, I understand that private wells are a big source of, of your water withdrawal. So we'll call this a conservative estimate of drought hazard. Um, but it's worth noting, so the areas that are popped up here pop up because of the ecological indicators of depleted groundwater. Okay. So that's what's going on there. So then we can look for nature-based solutions to handle drought. Um, the, we have two options for conserving for drought resilience um, based on whether they provide really great aquifer recharge potential based on where they are in relation to uh, surface waters and the soil type that's present. And then good aquifer recharge potential is basically anything that's unprotected and undeveloped that will infiltrate, infiltrate uh, soil or water. Um, and then for restoration, we can look for opportunities for stormwater management with infiltration. So when we look at Plimpton, again, these opportunities only overlap with the drought hazard. So there's this gap in the middle of town, um, but you have some opportunities up here that would provide really, that are providing you really great drought resilience right now. Mm -hmm. There's some opportunities down here as well. And then these lighter green areas are providing you with good drought resilience um, already. Um, thinking about stormwater restoration, especially to increase your drought resilience. So to make sure you're getting that water to infiltrate back into the ground, we'll focus on these areas where you could do practices with the soils that are in place. You could build a rain garden. You're not trying to, you know, you can let the water just go right back to the, to the water table. And that is this orange um, opportunity here. 
And, you know, there's scatters of it around through town. I don't know town well enough to know what these sort of outlines are, but I imagine that some of these are residential areas. Some of them might be commercial. We can pop back in and look at this um, in the online viewer if you'd like. And I just wanted to flag too, I saw in your MVP report that there's a town center redevelopment where you were thinking about low impact development. So we could look there as well if you wanted to. So you do have some, anyway, you have opportunities um, kind of all over, also in the middle where the conservation opportunities weren't um, as clear to think about stormwater management that could help you get water back into the ground. So now um, we can talk about the inland flood hazard. This one is um, looking forward a little bit more than the drought hazard did. And we do that by uh, just taking the 500 year flood zones from FEMA and 500 year flood zones from two different sort of models of, of what floodplains uh, look like. And we picked 500 years um, with the idea in mind that, you know, we don't um, have all these really fancy downscaled watershed models for what future precipitation will do to our floodplains. But we know that a 500 year floodplain is a, is a big flood and it doesn't happen. It used to not happen very often, but it will happen more frequently with climate change, which is the thinking here. So we also have uh, areas that are wet already. So existing wetlands and surface waters and then areas that have been converted wetlands. Um, which I didn't see very much of actually in Plimpton, at least in the DEP layer, but you have a lot of wetlands that are still show up as wetlands. So this is what the potential future flood print uh, looks like for Plimpton. And it, it's quite a bit of area. Um, a lot of this dark purple is FEMA. So these are, are areas that have been mapped to be either the 100 or 500 year floodplain with FEMA. Um, so that's what that looks like. So we can take a look now. We have two uh, options for thinking about inland flood resilience. The big categories are conserve and restore again. Um, and from the work I did to kind of peek ahead, I think looking at conservation and then some, oh, I didn't shoot. I didn't carry over the dam one. There are a couple dams that pop up in town that I can follow up with you on if you want. Um, but actually all I have today to look at is the conservation opportunity. And there's a bunch of them. Uh, you And you know that already, right? Like that's why you're prioritizing your open space plan and your conservation opportunities. But these are all areas that are currently unprotected and undeveloped that overlap with the inland flood hazard. Um, so there's, again, you know, there's opportunities down along the river, but really kind of all around town. And so now thinking back to some of the earlier talks that you had, thinking about soil carbon and freshwater wetlands and then uh, cranberry bogs, this is the uh, wetland layer map from the Department of Environmental Protection. All of this green area represents wooded marsh wetland and the red is current cranberry bogs. So I thought it would be interesting to kind of overlay that uh, with some of your conservation opportunities. And just thinking, you know, I, it's really exciting how this cranberry bog uh, is so nestled into this existing wetland. And so as you start to think about where you might restore cranberry bog or do a conservation project, it's kind of interesting to think about, you know, a combined project here where you could be protecting into perpetuity these wetlands because they are protected by the Wetland Protection Act. But we all know that projects sometimes get variances and wetlands get degraded. So protection into perpetuity could be a good idea. Uh, and then restoring this cranberry bog, you know, you get to have all the benefits of that. You get the outside soil carbon. So anyway, so then you have this, this kind of big connected area um, that's restored cranberry bog and conservation maybe. So there are a couple opportunities like that in town. So there's another one down here that's kind of a network. Um, and I have no, I didn't do any due diligence on how many like landowners this represents. So I, I don't, that would be a next step to take, but those are just areas that popped out for me just from looking at the wetland layer. So this is a wetland layer only. And then I pulled in the conserve for inland flood resilience layer. And again, you know, uh, Oh, then that's how I know. So much of these wetland areas that I had just sort of circled show up as conservation opportunities. So they have, again, they have that regulatory protection, but they aren't currently protected into perpetuity. And again, they kind of uh, dovetail nicely with these existing cranberry bogs 
and I, you know, this it's the same too that I pointed out before. So there are conservation opportunities there. Um, yeah, that you, that would. So these represent opportunities to conserve the inland flood resilience that you already have, and uh, potentially restore some inland flood resilience through a cranberry bog restoration and get your soil carbon goal. Um, and I guess the other thing I wanted to say about this is that these are wooded marshes. Um, I didn't overlay with the work that Manomet did, but I'm, you know, I can imagine, you can probably also imagine better than I can that some of their advice about forestry management could come into play for some of these projects as well. Oh, and then this is one in the middle that uh, didn't pop out at me as much for some reason. When I was looking at the current wetland layers. I think there's not as many wetlands around this bog, but but this is could be kind of a you know a stitched together network of inland flood resilience, looking at the conservation opportunities around this other bog. And these aren't the you know anyway. So those are the things that popped out at me. They're definitely not your only opportunities. And then I also took the wetland layer uh, and overlaid it with the opportunities to conserve for drought resilience. And um, the one down here that kind of popped out at me with the flood resilience layer pops out a little bit too with some opportunities for drought resilience. And I, I didn't go back and overlay the biodiversity layer, but I could, um, but I'm pretty sure you'd be able to think about packaging a project in this setting, for example, as providing you, conserving your inland flood resilience, conserving good aquifer recharge, restoring inland flood resilience through so cranberry bog restoration with a, with a, a co-benefit potentially of both high quality habitat and uh, regional connectivity. So that starts to stack up to be a really exciting project. Um, and those, that's the pre-screening that I did. So. Um, I'm happy now to take questions or we can go into these maps. If you want to zoom in on a parcel level, we can kind of do whatever you want with the last 30 minutes or so. I'd love to zoom in. I'm, uh, I'm on the Conservation Commission and, and some of my other partners aren't here tonight, but you know, on the CONCOM, we do pay a lot of attention to um, sort of the viability and, and we have really good local bylaw and regulations. So that gives us a tool. Um, but uh, some, of, some of them have changed, you know, over the last, we've had 13 or 15 large solar projects and some of the, uh, the growers here are, the average grower here is 15 to 20 acres, I guess. And, and many of our growers, if they have the traditional original berries, they're in that unfortunate five or 10% that doesn't Think there's a future very much for them ahead. Yep. Um, and we don't have any make pieces. They're giant, giant owners here. So, so we have many bog owners who are looking to the future here, trying to hold on, and trying to figure out, you know, what works for them. Um, so, th so that's an important subset for us as a town too. We're a right to farm town. The uh, wetlands and the are predominant in the town, and the bog owners are a big feature. The bogs are a big feature. Um, uh, so some. So we have had a couple of just going in now, we have a couple of dual use bogs, if you know what that is, you know, they're going to keep growing cranberries and, um, and they're also going to uh, have pa panels on them, solar panels on them. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's in one or two, one of the circles that you circled there, that'll be the case. But, uh, but in others, they're really just trying to hang on. And so uh, when, maybe now, not, don't have to look at tonight specifically, but that in general is an issue when you look at, you know, hanging onto the bogs and meshing them back into a complex of healthy wetlands. Um, that's a sub strategy that, you know, obviously the cranberry owners are very interested in. Would you, so would you like to um, have me try and find one of those? Yeah, circles? find one of your, find yeah. one of your okay. circles. Oh. Let's see, are you still seeing my screen? Are you seeing the map now? Yep. yep. Okay, great. I think imagery will help. So you'll have to forgive me not knowing Clinton quite as well as you all, but let's see what we can do. So I'm thinking that this area is, that is maybe one of the circles. Could that be oh, right? I was guessing that it was off 
um, Main Street. Let's see, where do the, I do better, Mark and others, you have a good eye. We, can we put a ro other uh, roads in there? I think one of the complexes was off Main Street would be my guess of your one of your circles. Al, Al Votrino probably knows this by looking at it instinctively. So where are we on that? That's is that 106 that I, I'm yeah, trying to not, the names aren't coming up, unfortunately. Yeah, the uh sorry. So the circle there's 40. What's it what's this over here? Over on the left hand side. This looks like yeah. I think that's Middleborough. That's I think Middleborough. Middleborough. I think that is Middleborough. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we gotta go. We gotta move over. Over east. Yeah, and north, and north too. And right. north. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. that's the airport right down at the bottom. You follow on the road over. Yeah. And to the right. No. 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 In the middle and up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Go north. It, See this um, big green patch you had on your other map? Yeah. Down, down a little to the left on the very bottom, you just went There's back. Silver Lake up in the upper right hand corner. Yeah, you. Okay, so come down a little bit then. Well, isn't that Route 44? Right here. I was wondering if it was 106. No, I don't think so. No, it's not 106. It's Maybe. probably 44 because it's pretty. So 44 and 58 would be a good junction to find. Yeah, that's that would be good. Okay, give me one second. There's Plimpton Center, I think, is right in the middle. Yeah, cool. looking more like this is Plimpton Center. No, up, up. Not, not that big. <laughs> bogs, Linda, are you looking for the dual use bogs? No, I was looking maybe for hard use and um, on Main Street. Hard use, okay. you, you got it there. Hazus is, is right in the middle. Just right in the middle. The yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> that's yep. that's Hazus. It's this one? Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. So let's see. So, it's, so that all that green around that is a conserve for inland flood resilience on that bog. Okay. And, and, um, and Do you want to see the biodiversity? Yeah, sure. And it doesn't have a lot of immediate wetlands then below it. Uh, you know what? The wetland layer isn't online. I went oh. in and did that. But this has the high quality habitat. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Right, right on that bug. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're cursed with high quality habitat everywhere. It's a terrible problem. This looks like a wetland to me right here. Yeah, above and, it, and to the north of it, just, maybe over here. Yeah. Just below, that's the Winnetuxet River. There you right. go. Yeah. Snaking yeah. across there. That's right. It's going into Car. It's coming up from Carver. Right. It, yes. And you have you have a very unusual confluence in this part of town because you have Whetstone Brook coming down from Plimpton, flowing down into North Carver and Northeast Middleborough, and yeah. you got the Winnetuxet flowing north through Clinton up into yeah. Halifax. Yeah. So it's a really, really interesting area. It is. You know, environmentally, ecologically. Yep. And you do also have actually good and better drought resilience mm -hmm. um, right on site as well. So you've got everything right here. And so, yeah, this looks like a wetland. This looks like wetland. This looks like wetland. So you're kind of all stitched in there. Right. And then you had a really big complex a little bit farther south towards the Carver line that was a much bigger circle. I was trying to figure that one out. I wonder, I'll turn these I off. Think, yeah, like yeah. This one, you got 44 there now. Yeah, yeah that's I think, yeah, right in the middle of the screen, right above 44. I think that's where it was, wasn't was it? Was it this? I was trying to guess. I didn't, I wasn't I sure. So. Huh. Do we know, do you know, should I zoom in on this a little bit? Was the one with the circles a slide? Was that a static slide? Yeah, it was. Can you it pull was. the slide back up again real quick? Does yeah. Does that help? So. Um, the three books thing is just off the back. Off 
Yeah, there we go. So right above 44 is still in Carver. So you have to go a little north of that to be back in Plimpton. Okay. Yeah. So this is 44, so we're... So that's, yeah. that's the old Whitworth property. Yeah. Down. Right in the <laughs> lower left-hand corner is your three... Well, what about this big comp? Uh, yeah, we'd, we'd like to go to, to Prospect Road. That's Hazards. And where, which one? Is that hard? Yeah, that one there yeah. is Hazards. Yeah. So go a little bit to the off, right. Off of Cedar Street. Off Cedar. So go down and now oh, see the three brown uh, bogs. That's it's right there. That's, that's it. The that's our new park. Oh, that's, that's your new, new park. park? Yeah, that's yeah. the one. That's well, your new have, park. 130 okay. or 40 adjacent to Seoul Street's conservation area. So that would be interesting to see what we can do there. You pop up well, for, yeah. for both. Yeah. Drought and flood. And of course, I probably don't even need to turn it on, but you got your high quality habitat again. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, and now we can go back up north to Harjis just a bit. So we want to follow along the Winnetuxet there a little bit. Can we swim along the Winnetuxet then, which is to the right of this, it's, you know, it's right above this. Yeah. It's right, very, very close. It's on the edge of that park. There you go. There it is, up to it, right in the middle at the top. Yeah. To this, yeah. And then that, that continues west, northwest past Harjis other bugs to the left. To the oh, left. west. To the left. left. To the left. Yeah. 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 Sorry. <laughs> See the dark. Is it this? Oh, right. Yeah, this one? yeah, that's yeah. Hard news. and that's the winter tucks it there. Yep. And and what we have in these new parks that we call two brooks is we have wow. the, the whetstone and the sawmill. Like what saw? What, what is it? Saw sawmill, of course. Do you remember the name? And you, <laughs> we have two. We call it two brooks because there are two brooks that yep. come in from the south from Carver, and are. Um, uh, the one on the left here is the one that's, um, I think, called sawmill, and the one that has been canalized a little bit through the bogs is uh, is part of the whetstone. The whetstone gets branched several areas here. So we were looking at how it connected down to Carver's uh, origination down uh, in Carver of the whetstone brook. Mm. So if um, that that's something we'd, we'll end up tracing because we're very interested in how the you know, water quality can be protected as well as the volume in the future. Um, so anyhow, we have, let's see, I think we're the ones in the lower right now by the legend box. That, yeah, that's, that's the new park. So if we went south from there a little bit, um, that's somewhere in there, we can't see this. That's Johnson's. That that's Johnson's. That's that's a, one, another grower named Johnson. And the, see the there is a, a drop down teardrop there. That's the pond on, on Johnson's property. Yep, right there. Mm -hmm. And um, somehow below that, the Whetstone Brook sort of sort of a form somewhere in Carver. And would love to understand. There's the dump. That's the dump. It's right behind the dump. <laughs> That's what's polluted everything down. Yeah, the dump is on the left. Well, actually, the Whitworth oh, property. The Whitworth yeah. property on the right. If you look at that, like looks like a, a racetrack, that aquamarine thing. Lower. Yeah. 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 So that's on the Whitworth property. That property was polluted by the Ravenbrook landfill on Plymouth Street in Carver. Right. And he, he it flowed underground to pollute his own property up above. Right. <laughs> so right. so that the the, uh, the Air Force is cleaning that up. I don't know about the middle blow dump. I, I don't, I think that water flows the other direction. Um, I'll tell you, when I surveyed that back line, which is the brook, mm -hmm. the pot, the pile of trash just went right down into the brook. Really? Wow. When was that, Al? I don't know. I've been doing this for 50 years, so oh. Oh, <laughs> no, many years ago. I well, would have to say in the seventies. Wow, because that that is a concern. When we had a, we hired a hydrologist two years ago to sort of give us the, the first lay of the land for this area about how all the brooks came together and what their history was, and where was there a history of contamination. So we do have all that documented, so we can understand it. But it will be something that we'll be interested in trying to further understand if we look at you know permanently protecting complexes here, what are going to be the most important? And if there's some restoration needed, where should we focus? Yeah. 
Yeah. So. In other people, the people in that area have town water from Middleborough because the groundwater right. is, is uh, contaminated. Yeah. Mm, tw 12 houses in Plimpton get Middleborough water right at the edge of the town there. Yeah. But, hmm. So, so we're going to be interested in all that, just to so because it all feeds into the Taunton River, which is a wild and scenic. You know, it goes. Our brooks go to the Winnetuxet, go to the Taunton. So yes. we're trying to analyze so we understand that too. If there's some important action we should be taking here to sort of preserve groundwater and quality and all that stuff, that this whole area we will focus on and would want to understand more. It's mm -hmm. also pretty neat, too, because like I was saying before we started tonight, all of this uh, goes into North Carver and Northeast Middleborough. Definitely. So it might be a really great regional project to hop on if you want to preserve the, you know, the natural resources in the area, uh, do climate response, resiliency, preserve open space for all the attributes that Sarah's showing you tonight, and actually affect some cleanup and maybe a cranberry bog restoration there to try to restore the natural wetland system. And I know I, I had spoken to Trish Cassidy times. Glad to see Sarah Hewins on from Carver. Hey, Sarah. I apologize. I thought it started at seven. I... No, no, this, this, is great. <laughs> this is great. Glad to have you. Thank yeah. you. And um, Sarah, Sarah's an old conservation agent too, so she knows her way around these maps. And uh, Trish right. Cassidy's a conservation agent from Middleborough. She was right. extremely interested in all of this too. So it might be something that everybody can get together at the end of this and really look at what we've right. evaluated and see where you can go regionally with it. Yeah, there's also, this is a, on Cape, but um, there's a group of folks thinking about what kind of contaminants and pollutants uh, bog restoration could help with, because the, you know, the Cape has such high nitrogen groundwater. Yeah. They're focused on nitrogen, but some of the, the techniques that they're thinking about in their bogs are, you know, filling in the ditches with like wood chips or biochar, and, and they're trying to see what other contaminants that that might help with. Um, so we don't have any great results yet, but they should soon. So that would be something to keep an eye on as well. Right. We still have a floodplain and watershed protection zone in Plimpton. Yeah, and it's just being uh, it's just being expanded because FEMA just put out new maps, so they take effect July first or something. So we just had to update the bylaw, you know, in the flood zones. And Brian, Brian Vasa, our, our conservation agent, he just worked on that. Brian, did our conservation did our flood zones change very much between the old zones and the new? Do you know? I haven't actually seen the new ones because I think they come out in July, but um, right. oh, okay. I don't think they're going to change too much. Oh, Brian, it's really nice. Yeah, we to took forty percent of the town and put it in that zone. Yeah, yeah. all of Carver. Well, not all of Carver, most of Carver. Now that was back in the '60s and early '70s. I remember that. Hmm. So, Al, so I sorry, I misunderstood. What did you say went into that zone? About forty percent of the town. Yeah. Was is, in it? is included in that zone? Oh yeah, no, it's a, it's a lot. Yeah. So we I have a lot of wetlands. <laughs> yeah, you do have a lot of wetlands. Yes, you do. Um, well, and there was another area on your map that was sort of uh, one of the circles, or maybe maybe it was off. I'm curious about one that's um, off, I guess, Main Street. We have, um, so if you can drive, yeah, go back to, no, the, right. to the right. To the, no, no, go the to other the way. Right. And yeah. then north. And oh. go north. Mm -hmm. Sort of like, uh, yeah, and keep going. So Al or someone help us get to which, where are the big Main Street bogs? Which that, ones? More bogs, the more bogs that um, are between Upland and Maine. Oh, that's a, I think that's right. Uh, the big ones in the right middle. Right there. Yeah. Right there, that's what I think, yeah, because they have yeah. reservoirs and everything. Oh, so yeah. what are the matrixes around yeah, that? That's Upland Road. Yeah. Is that? So that's all inland flood resilience um, is what's up there right now. Let's see if we get anything for drought here. Nothing for drought here, hmm. inland flood resilience. But again, that's probably because, you know, you could, if you were going back to MVP for, for an action grant for this, 
even though it doesn't pop up on my maps, especially with all these residential areas, it's pro individual homeowner wells don't show up in DEP's layer. So yeah. if there's a if this is a high higher density residential area for you, you could still make a case. I think that you are helping with drought resilience. You just wouldn't be able to point to these maps, but it you know you all just don't have big DEP wellheads. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, mm -hmm. it, the other place I think some of us would like to drive is to go east on Mayflower, which is so you go, I guess, a little south of here and, uh, nope. and nope. go nope. the other direction. Yeah. Yeah. And then to the right, going towards Kingston on our main street, which we call various names. Is that Mayflower? Where's the center of town? It's, yeah, that's that. You're on Mayflower now. Yeah, yeah that's uh, Lafleur's. Right. So where are Lafleur's bogs? They're north of Mayflower, though. Is that right them right there? No. That, that's his reservoir. The bogs are the green ones. Isn't he above to the left? Wouldn't those be Lafleur bogs? No. Go move the move the. Uh, that's Mayflower Road coming in right to the wall. This coming in from the left. That's Mayflower Road, and the road that connects across is. Is Colchester, yeah. That's that, that's that's the Fleurs bog right there. Okay, that's the Fleurs. Okay, and what about the bogs that um, Jeff Smith and everyone own? Oh, where are they? The Jeff Smith bogs out. They're up, the green ones up above, right yeah. directly above it. Right across from yeah. up, okay. a little bit. They're at the top there, right to the. Keep going on right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah those are the and, and they're next to a big wetland. So I was wondering. Sarah, if you could put up your magic, you had the purple insert, you, you had bogs inserted in wetlands and we, the town owns those wetlands north yeah, of- Yeah, the town owns everything from there to uh, the Dennett School. And beyond, because we own across the street. Um, it's 77 acres- Oh yeah, you're right, yeah. And yeah. 108 across Ring Road. So there's yeah. a lot of protected land and a lot of it is wetlands already. So I was right. wondering what, and some of the, the um, the bogs, uh, the Jeff Smith bogs down there at the bottom of this, they are going to have, uh, Brian, was it 20 to 40 acres of, of solar panels are going in there, I'm forgetting. And then to the left, it's a, a bog restoration. They're doing not a bog restoration, but they're doing habitat restoration for turtles. So it's going to be a, a natural uh, restoration area for turtles that feeds into that wetland. So they're abandoning them as bogs. No, no, I, well, I How think- How are they gonna go cranberries with no sun coming down? Well, that's, I think they- There's well, in that sandy patch in the middle, to the right, to the north, yeah, uh, just to the, to the east a little bit. This? No, no yeah, yeah, that sorry. That's where, that's where the solar field is. Huh, okay. And yeah. then the dual use projects at the, on the north point of the, uh, of the screen. Yeah, yeah that's, that's and one across the street. Yeah. They're not doing dual use though, and I think that the Jeff Smith bogs are—they're just doing regular solar on not restoring the bogs, right? Then they just plunk it down to the bogs. Right. And the up, the left-hand part of that is on the upper part of it is a, is turtle restoration. Mm -hmm. So that was an interesting area because it does we do own a lot of the wetlands that are embedded there. Yeah. So that just must not have the data layers that we have for this are a little old. So I don't know when you bought it, but it's. It shows as that's why it's showing up is because it yeah. it didn't show in the state layer as unprotected. But yeah, be interesting. I don't know. Do you own? Well, no, you no, you're into private there. I mean, the left hand part is is, is the town. Okay. But you go to the right, and it's a guy named Jeff Randall, I think. That those are bogs and stuff that he owns. But but you were mentioning residential wells. If you look at the developments there, coming off. Um, Mayflower, you know, and you see the developments. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, in general, if the t when the town has had some well problems uh, in the last 20 years, um, many, understandably, in many old towns, many of the old wells were 15 or 20 feet deep, you know, or 20, they were shallow. Yeah. Um, and so in years past, when we've had droughts, uh, Jane can, can speak to this, she was affected, but uh, people in several sections of town, we had to have a water truck come in because that was, and so that one of the reasons we worked with hydrologists to try to get a handle on 
where wells could be and the, we're just being to put our toe in the water about how to do a backup water supply. But the, the houses that have had some concern in the last 10 years about their wells being depleted are in the, are in the screen that we're looking at now. Mm. They're, they're in that upper right corner there and this. Sort of around this general area. Um, no, so, no, not that big subdivision, that's in Kingston. Okay. Okay, that's in Kingston. Where's where's the Mayflower? Yeah, these little ones here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the ones that are have been concerned. And so um there are there is some data from the state that we looked up. There have been a lot of people in the last 10 years who put in deeper wells <laughs> because they felt they had to. But yeah. we don't really have our hand, uh, you know, we don't understand all this very well, but how it relates to um, you know, coming droughts. Uh, I think we probably have a fair number of people who still have shallow wells and, you know, rolling all that together with groundwater protection and stuff. Is there, it's our number one concern in town, as I think you saw from the open space plan. Uh, it edged out just by a point or two. For 30 or 40 years, our con the resident's chief concern was keep Plimpton rural character. And that mm -hmm. we still all, everyone wants that. But because of the change of the climate and people are getting nervous, that the drawdowns are getting intensive or whatever, people uh, moved wa water supply to the number one priority a couple of years ago. Yep. Yeah. Just, just a point of interest, there is a water harvesting operation not kind of near those bogs, just past those subdivisions. Yeah. It's right, it's right, it's from the upland bogs that Jeff Smith owns. It's right it's below. At the, it's at the trout pools. Yeah, it's right at the trout pools to the right. Yeah, not quite. Yeah. So yeah. down. down, down. <laughs> so like playing a game. Uh, yeah, it's off Mayflower and it's at the end of, see where that sort of lighter green that blob. Bright green, yeah, the bright yeah. green blob. No, see the bright yeah. green blob go up. Right, yeah. 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 Sort, of, sort of to the left. To of the that. left of that. At, okay. That's, right there. Right there. that's sort of the wellhead. Yeah. And that's a commercial operation now owned by maybe Nestle, Pepsi. I forget who the owner is right now. Oh. And they oh. Do, I wonder, go ahead, sorry. They go take ahead. about 80,000 gallons a day, they say, that's their report, you know. Um, and I wonder, is it this? I wondered what this was. That, that from, uh, uh, yes, no. No, that, that's not, different. Yeah, oh. that's Kingston, I think. <laughs> I think that's Kingston's. Okay. They put a new thing in. It might be the other little round blob you had right there on that last map. Um, you had a, a there. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. would be in about the right place, I think, somewhere. Okay. okay. So whether, you know, we just know when uh, there's a lot of concern sometimes, but we don't have any connections and, and factual data. And so that's, I'm just raising that as another issue to understand that section of town really well. So I, you know, um, looking back, where is it? Drought, 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 drought. This one, I suppose. So, um, we did a lot of work with the Department of Conservation and Recreation on this, and they've just updated their drought standards, and they're talking more about flash droughts, um, which is something that we're expecting to see more of uh, with climate change. And the distinction between these is, is really based on whether or not when rain falls, it will kind of get in the shallow water table and go straight to a river and kind of get swept away. Mm -hmm. Or will it, is it more likely to go deep and do like a real aquifer long-term recharge? So, oh. you know, I could talk with Bill, if you had some areas in mind, I might be able to get my um, GIS team to look at huh. the potential around those areas, even if it doesn't overlap with your drought hazard, because as we already said, it's the private wells. Um, right. We could look at that as one way to think about prioritizing because you have a lot I mean obviously you have a lot of opportunities so um <laughs> we could think about exploring that I don't know Bill if that's that, I suppose you can't kick idea. me off the table <laughs> is that over promising that would be a great idea Sarah and um crew this would be a great thing to talk about at our next open space slash steering committee meeting yeah that way you'd have some time between this presentation and our next meeting to put down maybe some priority areas that we could suggest right. to Sarah Right. And even send back, like I said, Eric's going to go back and look at his stuff, you know, for the, the green in, critical green infrastructure. And we could go back and, you know, maybe tag it to soils also. 
and you know come up with some uh, priority spots for you to look at. That that's the whole purpose of this. If you have you know priorities on top of your priorities, now's the time you put everything through the filter. Yeah, and as you're thinking about bylaws, so I guess two things on that. One is maybe Vicki Zolte. We could invite her from DCR. She's she's sort of the drought guru that what, I have. What's her name? Vicki Zolte. Yep. Um, and then, so the, the actually one of these pictures on this slide, Franklin, Massachusetts has done quite a bit with incentivizing uh, really? residential rain gardens and things to, oh. I think they're seeing, they feel like they're already seeing benefits from that. Wow. And I, I just learned a week ago that Sharon has won some awards for their drought conservation and education. Wow. And Oh, great. So yeah, are... Paul Lowenstein up there has a great um, true water pricing system. He actually worked with the town of Georgetown on that too. So with some information, what the thing that Sarah was just talking about too is um, the town of Franklin, we have a great case study sheet that we put together before for one oh. of our other projects that we can definitely give to you guys. That'd be, yeah, things that for small rural towns that are mostly dependent on septic and their own well, you know, yeah. we need all kinds of information to help people, you know, help manage their own resources and if they're incentives. And, um, and the, I think the other thing I'm at least curious is, you know, when we try to figure out uh, where to start, uh, on the, in some ways we have a lot of riches because we have so many good things, but the bad thing is only 4% of the town's land is protected. Right. Now, you know, we do have a lot of, we do have a lot of, of wetlands and, we're, you know, hopefully that those are protected, but putting the package together of what do we, we do have two parks, if you two protected areas. The ones that we were looking at just now that we were talking about the turtle area above Jeff Smith's. So that's 77 acres plus 110 acres on the other side of the street. So that's that's a nice anchor on the eastern side of town. And part of it, when we looked at it originally, was uh, the only part of Plimpton that was open that was still over the Plymouth Carver Aquifer. You know, so we got most of that hundred acres right over the open part of the aquifer. It's not built up. Right. And then on this new park on the left hand side, of the, left hand is right, the west side of town. Um, that's going to be about 140 acres. It is 140 acres or so. And we adjoin about 200 acres of the sole farm. Uh, we're adjacent to it. It's technically in Middleborough, but we're neighbors. So, so that's a bump of 300, 350 acres. And we're, we just acquired that. So I, I think one of the things that we're gonna have to figure out is we can't you know, protect everything legally. Where are we going to get the biggest payback, so to speak, in terms of the biggest concerns that could hurt the town, whether it be for drought or you know, whatever, where is the best investment gonna be for protecting you know, the resilience of the town in the future? And, um, you know, I, I, for one, sort of get overwhelmed looking at that and thinking, yeah, there's so many good things and so many scary things. So how do we get our hands around that? Yeah, well, you have enough. I mean, I don't know if you're actually asking, but my, my first thought is like, yeah. you have enough opportunity that you could really look for large acreage, I think. Or, or areas where you'd be connecting other large acreage and um, areas where you're getting, you know, multiple benefits. And if it's along the river, so much the better. That doesn't yeah. pop out in this, but then you're getting water quality benefits as well. So right. just looking for how they stack, you know, you might have an area that's doing 20 things for you. Um, exactly. So I was just going to ask you about that. How do we look at the, at the riparian areas? I mean, how do you because obviously we have the two brooks and the way of the Winnetuxet and we do have, there are some large hunks of land there that are privately owned. So it's easier to, than dealing with hundreds of parcels. There are fewer people to could deal I, with. They're involved. Could I, you know. interject? Um, I just wanted to point out, as you all probably know, we bought a 221 acre property, the coal property that's just below right. the, the Plimpton town line. And right. it, it has a brook on it that we just named that flows into the Winnetuxet. And so I'm looking at your Plimpton maps and I'm thinking that whole area around the Harju, the first set of Harju bogs, I don't right. know if that's even feasible, but wouldn't that be lovely? <laughs> right. um, yeah, the Harju bogs off Main Street. Off right, right. Yeah. And then the other area that's also Harju's, I guess, that you, Al pointed out, 
um, which is a little bit more to the west and north. Yeah, that's well, that's along the Winnetuxet. That's along the, um, it's the Winnetuxet. Right, they both, they both are. That's my point, yeah. Oh, yeah, so yeah, no, well, that's on, in, in, in the new park area. It, uh, he owns that land along with another guy. He owns like 60 or 70 acres of forest land along the river. Right. And um, Eric uh, Wahlberg was out there looking at that. And then another landowner on the right-hand side of the river, just next, right next to the park, owns about 60 or 70 acres. Um, and so, and that's forested too. So uh, yeah, what is, so that's the other mix is how do we play into protecting riparian areas? And is that important for all these other qualities as well as, you know, biodiversity or whatever it is? I don't know, how do you do groundwater assessment in terms of threats to groundwater? I mean, how do, how does, how do you evaluate um, if some areas are more prone to groundwater uh, deterioration? Yep. So beyond these, uh, I guess also for the, the riparian zones, um, you know, for, forested cover in a riparian zone will really provide both outsized flood resilience and water quality benefits. You know, the more vegetation you have in there, the kind of the more you get of both. Right. Right. So one thing you could do as you're looking at these different opportunities along the Winnetuxet is see, think about, you know, what's up and downstream of, of any of the particular opportunities. If there are areas where you've had problem flooding, like that could be a thing to layer in. Groundwater is complicated. Uh, I, and you probably all know that. I definitely am not a groundwater expert. Um, I don't know if USGS has done any work on your, on the groundwater in your area. You know, the way we did these to think about actually what the flow paths are, cause that's kind of, that can be tricky. Um, and like what the travel time is and stuff like that. Uh, if you knew general flow paths, like we could look and see if there was anything from USGS. Do you know, Bill? You're muted. I see you're talking. Oh, Bill, you're muted. Bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, USGS had done a report in 2009. 2009. The Cover Aquifer, which takes up a substantial part of um, most of the study area in Plimpton that we're looking at. And I had passed that on to Peter Newton, in fact, when he was doing right. it. So that's, that's very well documented, all of that, Sarah. So we can probably get USGS information that we could layer on there. And I would bet it probably factors into the state's uh, critical conservation blocks, habitat blocks, and resiliency blocks. You know, so when you, when you layer one thing on top of another, and I believe Eric, when he was making his presentation, he did the layering effect with the, the uh, critical green infrastructure maps. Right. I think if you threw that on top of there and just kept doing layer on top of layer on top of layer. Uh, yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, it's like, like you said before, Linda, you have a, a a treasure trove of gifts and uh, they'd all pop out. So yeah. this is be the way you prioritize it. Like what Sarah's getting at tonight, you look and see what you really want to do, what's right. most consistent with your plans and the goals of your plans. And we can help you use this information to help you prioritize. And I think, you know, actually having your neighbors involved too, like having Sarah here tonight and having Trish interested, it's Wonderful. That, yeah. that makes it really good because then you can look at these regional things where you can talk across political boundaries, because nature doesn't know political boundaries, you know, and, and the protection that you can afford nature in these areas, you actually afford them to your towns, your neighbors, and something that's critical to the state, you know, overall resiliency in the Commonwealth and definitely in the watershed. So it's yeah. kind of cool. Yeah. So with those groundwater maps, you know, if, especially if they have a flow path, at least the direction, like the general direction, then you can start to think about like, where are your septic systems clustered? Where's the landfill in relation to the groundwater flow paths? And, you know, it might not give you like a crystal clear answer, but you could kind of have a sense of like, you know, where your groundwater is not flowing from a place where it's likely to have pollutants in it. Maybe you would prioritize that. Um, that could be one way to do it. Um, I believe well, there was a map drawn that shows how much of the town has had polluted water back at that time. Yeah. It was, it was like several acre, I mean, several square miles. Yeah, Peter Newton, when we hired him in 2000, yeah, I think it was 18, 
Yeah. He went through all of the last 50 or 60 years of reports. He looked at all of the contamination sites and he consolidated it into a report oh, that, we, that we use. Um, and he's available, you know, he lives locally still. And um, so he tried to he he tried to analyze all of that data and boil it down to like a 10 page report for us to understand, you know, what's going on. So that's available, and I'd love to have you guys, you know, take a look at you know, because he he's it was a great fire hose of data that you know was a lot for us to absorb. Yeah. Um, but but in terms of the groundwater, if the water supply, you know, is that's a main concern, obviously, for people who live on wells, and um, even if the town starts to looking at a, a long term solution or backup, you know, to there's, that's not going to be a turnkey operation. So one of the things that I think we might want to make sure that we understand is, you know, are there groundwater pools? Are there groundwater resources that we need to pay attention to in terms of flow or just uh, uh, supply? Because yep. because that's all we have. You know, we don't have we don't have anything else. <laughs> How do I get off of this? I got to leave. Just say goodbye and turn off your, uh, probably the right hand X, is it something like that? Usually there's a little X in your top right. Okay, so, thank you for inviting yep. me. I enjoy these things. Yeah. Bye well, now. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Have thank a good you. day. Thank you. Stay thank safe. You. You, you too. You too, Al. And so another thing about, I don't, I have not seen that report, this is, Another thing that is happening more frequently on Cape Cod uh, is thinking about um, what's coming off of your septic tanks. And I, I think I saw somewhere in the materials I reviewed thinking about bylaws for septic systems. Um, and I can share with Bill, That'd you know, there's nothing that's exactly as cheap as, as a straight up Title V, but there are some um, add-ons now that just use wood chips that reduced contaminants of emerging concern and can get most of the nitrogen out and, and both of those things can help protect your groundwater. The other thing I'd say about it generally, and you may have already heard this, but you know, thinking when you think about your bylaw, thinking about like how you can keep minimize impervious cover so that you aren't cutting off your supply, right. maximize infiltration so that you can get some more water back in and then maybe think about like um, summertime bans or education on use because that those are your those are kind of your two big tools right as to how do you optimize your supply and then sort of educate people to control demand yeah yeah well again any models from other towns like ours that are on individual systems that would be a great model how did they get to landowners because um, people are motivated, they want to make sure that they're safe. But you know, we haven't. I don't think we've been able to. We, we haven't tried to sort of capture that kind of um, information to make it easy for people to respond to. Yeah. Hmm. So I can do some homework with Bill. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So what else should we be thinking about so that we could try to make a rough cut at priorities? Because um, what would you say the big factors are that you think that, you know, that given our situation, do we start with, you know, groundwater protection because of the well and septic thing? And do we start with um, keeping the resources we have to protect uh, large flows like the rivers and, this, you know, what do you, how would you dive into the pool and, and have your biggest you know, factor first, it's sort of an umbrella. Great question. You know, I, we sometimes talk about this work kind of like the reduce, reuse, recycle hierarchy. I, Conserving what you already have is probably the best thing you can do. Um, just generally speaking, it, you know, we're getting better and better at restoration, but the... Right it's really hard to capture all the services that a natural ecosystem provides once it's lost. So, you know, I, that's where I would focus. Uh, and, and then, you know, I do think you have enough areas of overlap. Um, I would think about size, um, conservation. Do you like landowner willingness is not a small thing either. You know, you don't want to be beating your head uh, against a wall. Um, do you have an opportunity to grow an existing park to make an area bigger? And then, you know, you asked me about the riparian zones. You could start to think about 
you know, because you do have so many opportunities, you could pick a like a belt along the Win the Winnetuxet and just see like what kind of acreage is there um, and how it overlaps with the drought resilience. Because anything along that river that's not protected will give you inland flood resilience. Basically, I think we saw that as we were looking through. So. Um, yeah, I would stack things and I'd think about size. You know, we TNC also did a model. We just did it in um, the mill and the Namaskit where we really prioritized opportunities for wetland restoration based on like, are they above a neighborhood? Are there skewed culverts nearby? Is it in a topographic basin? Like really trying to catch all of the geographic things that would make it really provide you good benefits. And I could share that prioritization okay. framework with you. Um, and we could think about how you might be able to do that without having to run a really complicated GIS model, but just take some of those um, priorities. Yeah and sort of translate them, we I could help with that a little bit. All of that, any models we can see how people try to sort of, you know, put the pyramid together here to try to upside down pyramid, you know, you start with the bigger and go to, you know, that would help a lot to sort of help us get in. No. And then, you know, another thing that Matt Poisset did, and they were successful in getting MVP funding for this, they kind of looked around town and thought like, where would it be really bad if <laughs> this was a neighborhood? And right let's keep, you know, we don't want to have to deal with the roads or whatever it was. Um, so that's another way if there's anything that like really strikes you is like, we really don't want people here. Right. We just need to buy, you know, make make a, a, a key purchases throughout the town. You know, that's the problem. <laughs> it's like, you can't do that. You know, people want to live here, but also we have a lot of opportunities in wetlands that hopefully will stay pretty, you know, pretty protected if the Wetlands Act and bylaw. That yeah, well, gives, that, sorry, uh, go ahead. That gives us an advantage in some ways. Um, yeah, if your wetland bylaw is strong and, and people aren't getting variances on that and you're confident in it, you know, you could exclude the wetland area from your conservation opportunity. And that would narrow the footprint quite a bit. Um, if you feel confident that the bylaws are going to handle it, then you could look for areas that don't have any regulatory protection oh, um, that would be providing you with services and focus on those. Yeah, that and that would, uh, again, going through the filter, then you could look at what the remaining areas provide for you in free services, you know, and that's where you get the real nature-based solutions. You start, you start stacking the, the attributes of those areas on it and you might say, yeah, streamside forests are, are critical. Right. You know, the linkages are critical. Where you have town land is critical and then it makes your wetlands uh, almost like town land. You can say, where, where can we provide, again, these critical linkages between the different types of habitat that perform these services for our town? So, and again, that's that's what Sarah was kind of teeing up for the next one too, the, the strength of your bylaws. And it might be fun because in the next um, workshop, Danica is actually gonna run through the Mass Audubon tool with you to show you what it does. And then she was thinking of doing a follow-up workshop where she would take one of your bylaws and walk through it with you to see, is it as good as it could be? Yeah, we, we, we'd love that because it really brings it home, you know, in terms of how things work. And it would really kind of reinforce what Sarah's saying tonight. You can have all this great information, but you really have to know how to put all of these pieces together. Which <laughs> why we're doing it that way. We're going one, you know, one into the next, into the next, into the next. So you'll have everything. You have all your information, your tools, right. and probably a good way to think about things. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting idea to sort of, in effect, say check off the wetlands and say okay we have a pretty tough tool for that already um and that might dovetail into some of the complications having to do with either septic rules or planning rules or something like that but but if if they come to concom um we're fair you know and all that stuff but we don't give variances basically you know, it's just, you, you have to have a really good reason and it can only be in the public interest. If you don't have a public interest for the variance, you're not going to get it. Yeah. So, but, but, but the that's great. Is that's you really great. You should be a case study. I don't, I <laughs> very rarely hear that. <laughs> yeah, well, it's only two or three years old. The, the bylaw is 10 or 11 years old and we've been pretty consistent, but we just passed the regulations writing it all down two years ago and uh, it helps. You know, 
So, Sarah, Susan, what were you going to say? Well, just the, the only the danger in saying, well, that's all protected is that you, right now you have a very strong board, but at right. another time you may have a board with a very different feel for this and may it, they may right. use variances right and left. So I don't think that's a safe way to, right. to, to, I think you have to not just assume that stuff's all protected. I think that's dangerous. Uh, we can have whoever, you know, who's doing the bylaw. The, the bylaw does, own, does not allow variances without public interest. So, the, so that would give someone a re, a grounds to appeal because it has to be in the public interest. But yes, but we can use- Bylaws can be changed too. That's the problem. <laughs> yes, they can. <laughs> well, it's, it's probably good timing that you're actually going through this whole exercise because if you have a strong bylaw, in a strong and committed board or commission, then it's a good time to maybe think about picking up the areas around these wetlands because then you can strengthen your position, you know, going forward. You can say it's protected, it's next, it's, you know, contiguous to wetlands and the whole bit, you know, you start looking at your town that way. What you can do while you, while you have this strength because th that's, that's an asset right there. It's the people and the commitment that are the bottom line asset. Well, you can have everything. Sarah and Susan have very relevant points, though. They can, bylaws can be changed. Oh, yeah. People do get tired, volunteers. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> just saying. And, uh, and that we need new volunteers in town. I'm not just talking about me, but I'm, yeah. But, you know, people have been on it a long time and it's going to rotate. So we need more people to come in to take over, you know, the next generation of these committees. Um, to keep the momentum going. A lot of the work's been done to at least set up the rules and get things going and prove they work and all that stuff. But we, we hope to do more outreach in the town over the next year to get people in to say, hey, you know, it's all set up. It has all the wheels on, everything drives right. But, you know, we need some other drivers now. <laughs> and, and just, I'm sure you all, so most many of you know this, but the, the driver behind the new CONCOM bylaws in our Earth removal by it's all Linda. Can I just give credit where it's due? She's the driving force in town. Well, that's not credit. It's just that it, I have a very boring life, really. But, uh, <laughs> no, you have a lot of talents that you used yeah. to help. The but, um, well, we we uh, uh, but, you know part of me just hates to see the town get beaten up, so we you know try to strengthen our bylaws to make them work better. Because you know we had a developer call us four or five years ago, a sitting duck, and that was just like waving a red flag at a bull. All of us are bulls, and we don't like that. We want to keep our town safe. But so we've made good progress as a unit. There are a lot of people in town here who've done brilliant things. But you, you know, you have to turn over and you get new people in. Um, and we have to, you know, if, if you have the best document in the world. If we get don't get people involved in understanding it, it's yeah, it can change overnight. So that's but it goes back to how do we choose what we're gonna invest in? You know, that's that's what's sort of the overwhelming thing. Well. Maybe once the project's done and you have the project page to work with and the documents to work with and the philosophy, maybe that'll help attract more people and it'll definitely be there for everybody to look at. So they'll know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Yeah, I think I think sometimes if people feel they don't have to invent the wheel, you know, the wheel's there already and just get on the bus. That might make it easier <laughs> than saying, ah, you know. So um, we might have some structure that we could make a, a better sales pitch. We're getting there. Any other questions for Sarah? Are we are we good till um, the next time? This is a brilliant, really, really helpful, interesting, fascinating way to look at this stuff. I've always sort of wondered, like, how does those, how do they look together? So being able to do this is really useful, really useful. All right. Thank you for putting up with my backwards um, screen driving. <laughs> that always confuses me. <laughs> well, it's a big green area with a lot of bogs. It's pretty hard to figure out which way to go. <laughs> <laughs> which ones? Yeah, right. So, but great. This has been really helpful. Really interesting. Very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So everybody do their homework for nice, the next steering committee meeting. Yeah. Open space committee meeting. And then uh, next month we'll get ready for Danica. Yeah. And the next open space meeting is April 8th. So I'll we'll yeah. get the note because it's the second Thursday. So. We'll get that out and definitely we'll be talking about this stuff for sure, trying to, you know, take it to the next step. All right. And I, I, when, if you want me to uh, print out any of the, you know, if you want, Bill, a follow up with me if you need any. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah, thank you, Sarah. This has been really, really interesting and we're going to you know, need it a lot. You know, we'll be looking and staring at this and going over it again and again. Thank you a lot. 
So and we, have, we have your number. We know where to find <laughs> you. <laughs> well marked people now. All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you all so much. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. It was good to see you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you, sir. All right, guys. Good night.